Welcome. I'm Christiane Hardy, the Interim Director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. We are delighted that you have joined our program today, How to Build an Anti-Racist Foreign Policy. As we enter the final quarter of 2020, we are faced with a presidential race that offers two significantly different worldviews and radically different approaches to foreign policy. At the same time, in cities across the United States, like Louisville, Minneapolis, and Portland, protests against the excessive use of force and murder of black men and women by the police forces have stretched beyond 100 days. We are at a historic moment, one in which we are facing the most significant reckoning of American race relations in decades. Notably, this reckoning has directed our collective attention to the ways in which our institutions, and not just individuals, perpetuate racism. Today, we'd like to shift this focus to foreign policy and the ways in which the international system in which we are embedded and the institutions and practices of foreign policy protect power hegemonies and perpetuate systemic racism globally. We have invited two really smart, thoughtful people to discuss this. Kathleen Powers is an assistant professor of government at Dartmouth. Her research brings the insights of psychology to international relations, where she investigates the social and cognitive forces that shape how people think about global politics. She has conducted research into how core beliefs about right and wrong, that is morality, shape everything from support for war with Iran, to working with the United Nations, to bailing out an embattled Greek government during the debt crisis. She recently completed a book manuscript that examines how different types of nationalism can either push Americans towards militarism or war, or lead them to support more proportionate foreign policy options. She received her PhD from Ohio State and at Dartmouth teaches courses on psychology and international politics, public opinion about for US foreign policy, and introductory courses on international relations. Joining us as a virtual guest at Dartmouth is Travis Adkins, a lecturer of African and Security Studies at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He has spent two decades in international development, working on governance, civil society, refugee and migration affairs in more than 50 nations across Africa and the Middle East. This includes serving as staff director of the US House of Representatives Subcommittee on Africa, as well as working with leading non-governmental organizations and think tanks, and within several branches of the United Nations system. Mr. Atkins has served in numerous international election observation missions in Africa and the Middle East with the National Democratic Institute. He is a contributor to multiple publications and news outlets and hosts the podcast On Africa, which engages diverse leaders in conversations on the continent's history, politics, and culture. He recently co-authored with Judd Devermont a terrific piece in Foreign Policy magazine on the legacy of American racism at home and abroad. As a black man, he has the dubious distinction of having promoted democracy rights abroad that he does not fully and freely enjoy at home. We thank them both sincerely for letting us in on their conversation. Over to you, Professor Powers. Thank you so much for that fantastic and warm introduction. Um, Travis, I am super excited to have this opportunity to talk with you today about this incredibly important issue about which uh, I've already learned so much from you and I'm, I'm eager to learn more. Um, so I want to start by saying that, you know, the goal of our conversations today, the title of this whole session is how to build an anti-racist U.S. foreign policy. But this sort of underscores the fact that there are a couple of preliminary questions that we need to answer and things that we need to understand before we can answer that question, right? How to build an US anti-racist UN foreign policy sort of presupposes that there is some racism built into US foreign policy and built into the way foreign policy and international security is conducted. Um, and so I want to start there with sort of the diagnosis of the problem and how you see the, the history of U.S. foreign policy and international security and how that has contributed to some of the problems that we're seeing today. And we'll, we'll talk about those in more detail. But yeah, if you, we could start there. How did we get yeah, there? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Katie. Um, I think one of the main issues 
is this kind of false dichotomy uh, between foreign and domestic policy, right? And so when we're talking about the United States, my supposition is that our foreign policy is racist because our domestic policy is racist, right? And so it is an outgrowth of who we see ourselves as in the world, what the American project is in its ideals versus what the American project has been um, in its realities. And so when we're talking about kind of the US foreign policy framework, you know, I usually start in my coursework and in the passion and drive of, of my writing with the US relationship to Africa. And if you look at that relationship, you know, I often ask my students, if you were teaching a course like this, where would you want to start? And sometimes they're saying, you know, after the Cold War or, you know, after World War II, right? These seminal kind of milestone uh, points in history that the global order shifted within. Uh, but I take a tack that is much further uh, back than that, because if you start there, you will miss what I consider the two most significant engagements that the United States has had with Africa. One is the transatlantic slave trade, which brought 12 million um, African people to the Western Hemisphere. And the second is the founding of Liberia, which literally um, the U.S. established um, to send back free black people that it did not want to have in the American um, society. And so in that way, it actually changed uh, the map of Africa and kind of concretized uh, a stance that it would have in the sense that it was creating essentially a racialized caste system even before its independence, right? And so we know 1776 is our independence date, but 1619 is the date where those first Africans came onto the shores uh, of the United States in Virginia. And from that point were subjected to a, a racialized caste system placing them at the bottom of society, placing them outside of the realm of the protection of law and the considerations of services and protection by the state. And so that to me is the kind of jumping off point for how our foreign policy gets to the place um, that it is. So this is really interesting. And I think there are, well, there are probably infinite numbers of really important things that you just said, but there are two that I really want to pick up on. Um, the first, and, and this one I'm going to put a pin in, but this notion of sort of how domestic politics translates into the foreign policy realm, because I think that's really quite important. But I also want to talk a little bit more and have you dig a little bit more into what you were saying with respect to sort of how we tend to focus on these big moments of quote unquote change, right? After the World War II, we had the emergence of the so-called liberal international order. After the Cold War, we had the unipolar moment. After 9-11, we had this global war on terrorism. But it sounds to me that what you're saying is that there's actually quite a lot of consistency over time. And there's quite a lot of consistency in this one particular area. And I guess I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on sort sure. of how that has remained constant and what this looks like and what are the effects when it comes to sort of international institutions or the way the U.S. exercises power or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, I draw what I conceive of as a pretty clear historical line between the nations who make up the international community in the present day and the nations who essentially established uh, a, a world order in which Western European white dominated nations would be predominant in military, uh, in economics, in global governance, uh, and the like. And so if you look at that and you go back through the course of history, you say, okay, there are a handful of Western European nations that were the architects and the main drivers and the main beneficiaries of the transatlantic slave trade, right? And so for four centuries, they took the wealth and human resources from the continent of Africa, spread them all across the Western hemisphere for the production of tobacco and cotton and sugar, and basically created uh, the founding capital that allowed them to grow into the predominant economic nations of the world, while at the same time plundering the nations from which they took those resources. And then you fast forward into the colonial era, and guess who are the main drivers of the European colonization of Africa? It is the same nations who were behind 
the transatlantic slave trade. And then you fast forward out of the colonial era and say, wow, who are the nations that we consider to be the international community? And if you look at the core of that group, it is that same group of Western European nations who are now saying that they are the uh, progenitors of human decency and democracy and morality, when in several chapters before this, they were actually the conquerors, the plunderers, the destroyers, the massive extractors of wealth and human life and resources to the disadvantage of the areas and people for whom they took and to the advantage of themselves alone. And so one of the things that I like to point out to students is that in this modern era, if we want to do the right thing, that's fine. But the idea that we are implicitly the good guys, the idea that we get to wear some type of a halo for trying to rectify what in fact Western powers over the course of several centuries are responsible for destroying. And not only destroying in a physical and economic sense, but also destroying in terms of the image of how we see the world and how we see other people, right? And so you get these um, kind of theoretical ideas of the first world and the third world, the developed world and the underdeveloped world, right? The light and the dark, the black and the white, the east and the west, the global north and the global south, right? One above the other, right? And because there's so much kind of militaristic and religious history also involved in that, you could even make an argument for the global north and the global south being representations of heaven and hell, right? And this notion of as above, so below, right? Which is like Christian biblical uh, textual language. But when you look at the global uh, kind of economy and the global uh, economic and development system, that is really what the West is saying, as above, so below, that you all should make yourselves more like us. And so it was this kind of effort to, for European nations to replicate their ideals, their cultural mores, their religion, their systems of governments across the whole world, whether those people wanted it or not. And one of the main innovations in that is the ability to consistently and effectively apply mass violence by which they were able uh, to subdue uh, much of the planet in the imperial and colonial era, uh, and even up into today, if you're talking about economic uh, and military powers in the world. Uh, this, is, this is really interesting. When you were talking about sort of the extractive capacity of, of colonial powers and sort of how they were uh, engaging in a process of violent extraction in order to build their own power over time. I'm reminded when I when I teach our introductory IR course and we talk about colonialism, I, I show this uh, cartoon that's basically a uh, hollowed out African continent with a big pile of money uh, on the European continent to sort of illustrate what, what they were doing. Um, and it's interesting, right, from, a, from an IR theory perspective, right, we often talk about how well, of course, this is what states are going to do, right? What, what else would we expect of states that are just seeking to build their own power? What else would we expect of states that are just seeking to build their own security, but to be extractive, but to use violence to advance their own interests? Um, but I think this brings up this, this, uh, this tension between what you have talked about with respect to the U.S. in their foreign policy and Western powers in general, sort of arguing that they have the moral high ground, right? So they might be pursuing power, but they're doing so with sort of a set of good values, a set of um, uh, a set of things that are supposed to be better and, and to be imposed upon others in a in the interest of making a so-called just world or something like that. Um, how how do you think that's going? Well, obviously not. <laughs> obviously not very well from the perspective of most of the world because those things are in some ways diametrically opposed to one another. And this goes back to the history of how the global order uh, is formed. When you look at the Bretton Woods institutions, when you look at the rise of the League of Nations into the United Nations, mm 
and this notion of needing to be able to have a world without war, or at least where industrialized democratic nations are unified in some way, your NATO and the European Union and other kinds of transatlantic um, partnerships, right? But the reality is that those are the nations that actually had destroyed the world, right? And so we live in a time now where Africa, and in some senses, Latin America or parts of South Asia are kind of a painted carte blanche with this brush of violence and messiness and political backwardness, right? But the reality is we've only had two world wars and both of them started in and were centered around and destroyed Europe, right? And so there was this process of Europe over the course of 50 years continuing to destroy um, itself. Um, and it had done the same thing in terms of internecine conflict when they began uh, their foray into Africa in the colonial era until, of course, the 1884 Berlin Conference in which European powers met and basically decided, look, we shouldn't be running over each other and fighting each other um, to dominate this region of the world. So let's carve it up and decide which slices we want to take over and against the people from whom we wish uh, to extract. And so there is a, a whole other history there around the development of the identity of whiteness, right? Because obviously Germans and French and Britons, right, did not see themselves as one people, did not see themselves as necessarily connected with a singular kind of global mission, right? But in this era, we start to see uh, the formation of that, right? We start to see people being called black who don't call themselves black, right? They become black when people who think they're white show up on their shores. And then you get the creation of a world uh, striated by the tones of the skin of different people in different parts of the world, and then having different values assigned to their lives based on that system. Yeah, this, this reminds me of um, a lot of the work in psychology on sort of attribution errors and this idea that my motives are pure and good uh, and your motives are, are actually quite evil, right? And so my motives are pure and good. So even if they come with sort of destruction or, extractive, or extraction, um, that's fine because I'm doing them for good reasons. Um, and this is the things that we tell ourselves. Um, I also thought it was really interesting at the end how you, you brought up this idea of sort of constructing these racial categories in a way that was uh, convenient and benefited some of the European powers. Um, and I thought that was interesting for lots of reasons, but two of them being that, one, we know from social psychology that one of the best ways to get a group to come together and identify in some way is to give them some other out group to identify against, right? So if you needed Germany and France to stop fighting with each other, well, you give them somebody else to, to serve as the out group. And in this case, you're arguing that that's, that was people in the continent of Africa. Um, I thought that was, that was really interesting and quite important. And the other thing that you said that, I, that really hit, hit, a, hit a nerve or sort of made me think a lot was this idea of constructing these racial categories. Because we talk about this a little bit in my psychology and IR courses at Dartmouth, where we talk about um, identity conflict and quote unquote ethnic conflict and things like that. And one of the things that I'm always trying to sort of help people understand from a historical perspective is this idea that yes, these categories are constructed. And yes, these categories are often constructed in ways that are totally wrapped up in the colonial system, but that doesn't make them any less real in the sense that they have real consequences. And so we have to hold those ideas in our mind at the same time, and that can be really challenging. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I couldn't agree more, and this is something that I talk about with students and colleagues all the time, uh, Katie, and that is, you know, if you go and look at the world from outer space, right, you don't see boundaries, you don't see borders, right, but you'd be foolish to think you could just cross over the border from Iraq into Iran and that you wouldn't have a serious problem if it was a place that you weren't supposed to be, right? And these are imagined nations, imagined communities, creations uh, of human minds and, and, and systems uh, and governments. But they are, in fact, life or death issues. And that is why the world has been organized 
in the way that it is. And so there's no accident that the Africa region is in the condition that it's in. There's no accident that, you know, Asia and South Asia have the relationship to Europe that they have, right? These are things that uh, are the outgrowths of histories and narratives of war and conflict and conquest and attempts to resist and push back. And so when you look at our global system now, it is that same kind of thing. You look at the United Nations, you look at the Security Council, who has the power, right? Who has the ability to veto? Who are the nations that are on the outside uh, of that in group um, that is really based on an old world order where it was supposed to be a given that a handful of Western European nations uh, would in fact rule the world? Right. And, and this sort of is a good place to maybe pivot to, to one of the things that I really want to hear you talk about some more, which is sort of, okay, now we've got this historical mindset. We have this sense that these things happen. They've become institutionalized, which again, even if they're somewhat socially constructed, sort of makes them real and consequential. Um, but what are those consequences? What do you see as the consequences for this racialized system today um, in terms of specifically the U.S. foreign policy conduct? How does it um, inhibit the U.S.'s ability to get things done? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, the idea of hypocrisy, um, the idea of not facing the shame of one's own history is really at the root of this, right? And so uh, the, the uh, human rights activist and lawyer Brian Stevenson, he often talks about this sense of nations facing their shame, right? And so you have the example of Rwanda, where there's a big push to sub, sub, submerse this idea of differences across ethnicity. You have modern day South Africa trying to push past its history of apartheid, right? You have Germany that has made so many strides to try to not only memorialize uh, what happened in the Holocaust, but to fix it and to turn that nation in a different way. But when you look at the United States of America, we have a different context, right? We have a context in which the purveyors of racialized violence are actually exalted as heroes, are actually concretized as a, a strata of almost godlike figures, the founders of our nation, right? You go to the nation's capital and everywhere you turn, there's a statue of one of these men. And if you close your eyes and just pick one, uh, chances are that that person would have been a slave owner, uh, that that person may have been involved in violence against native or indigenous people, uh, that that person certainly held views about women or, or about black and brown people or immigrants that is antithetical to what we say our ideals are. And so in the context of coming inside of America, how did you pick because, because we love this idea of good guys and bad guys. Well, how do you say the good guys are the bad guys, right? If the founders of the nation were the promoters of white supremacist ideologies, uh, were people who said, look, the Negro is not equal to the white man, right? Who came up with this notion of the Negro problem, right? Which was, how do we deal with a population of people inside of America who we never brought here with the intention of integrating, whom we never brought here with the intention of making them citizens, right? And so that is the domestic fight that we keep seeing ebbing and flowing, even now in the streets on a daily basis across our nation. And it is rooted in the fact that you have a population here who you have enriched yourselves off of, whom you have extracted labor from under torture for centuries, whom you have oppressed as second-class citizens uh, for another hundred years after the period of enslavement. And now you're trying to say to the rest of the world that you are this paragon of goodness and light, but they know better, right? And so I think of a few examples of, you know, the U.S. dealing with South Africa under apartheid and the legal system of apartheid begins in 1948. Well, in 1948, guess what was happening in America? Jim Crow was far and wide um, in our nation. So we had our own apartheid system. So imagine a foreign policy 
where you're trying to coerce and urge and show the light of, of goodness and dem democracy and human dignity in South Africa. And they can look at you and say, well, we see what is happening um, inside of America. And so even if it's outside of Africa, imagine anyone trying to promote human rights when anywhere in the world, somebody can log on to social media, turn on their televisions, pick up a newspaper and see our cities on fire and see black men and women murdered in the streets unarmed and unprotected with no consequences. To see US police forces looking like armed military battalions in Afghanistan, except they're rolling through the streets of Baltimore or Ferguson or Minneapolis, right? And so our lie is exposed to the world. And when you have that, then how can you have an equal partnership? How can you think that you can engender trust uh, in people and nations of color uh, throughout the world when they see what you do uh, in your own backyard. Uh, so this is uh, this is incredibly insightful and interesting. And uh, I have a couple of things to say before I pitch it back to you. One is that I think your point about the way that these sort of domestic politics spill over into the foreign policy realm via sort of the hypocrisy of US foreign policy is really quite interesting. And it's quite interesting for a number of reasons. One of them is that when IR scholars often write about the role of norms and domestic norms in foreign policy, it's often from sort of a, a good place in the sense that yeah. you, you mentioned sort of the, the pernicious effects that 1948 US domestic politics had on uh, their relations with apartheid South Africa. But we also know that the US civil rights movement in concurrent with the global civil rights movement much later might have helped put U.S. Congress to implement the boycott on South Africa and to bring an end to the apartheid regime. And so IR scholars do this kind of research and right, we have good evidence showing that that's exactly what happened. The U.S. civil rights movement pushed these norms, those norms went and uh, made their way into this U.S. foreign policy practice that helped push back against the, the racial inequality that existed in South Africa. But what you're saying, and I think is important, is that it it can go the other way too, right? You can have these, these much more negative norms make their way into the foreign policy realm. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you see that in practice today. So you mentioned that you know, people can log on and see what's going on in US domestic politics, uh, but how do you see that in like actual diplomacy? To what extent uh, has this affected the US ability to sort of get what they want in the diplomatic realm? Um, and what are some illustrations of that? Sure. You know, one story immediately comes to mind, and that is uh, I was with uh, members of a congressional delegation uh, in Egypt, and this was about five or six years ago. Uh, and we're in a meeting with President Sisi at the time, who had um, been accused essentially of killing or abusing hundreds and up into the low thousands uh, of protesters uh, during the so-called Arab uprisings or Arab Spring at that time. And they were basically kind of uh, chastising him in some way for the treatment of people uh, that were citizens of his country, uh, for the abuses against civil society. And he listened to them and he had a kind of smile on his face, almost a smirk. And they finished. And after they finished, he said, well, can I ask you all a question? And they said, sure, Mr. President. And he said, what about Ferguson? And at the time that he asked it, Ferguson was on fire, right? And there are tear gas canisters and rubber bullets and water hoses and things are on fire and people are being arrested and abused um, and so forth. And this was a direct challenge, right? In the moment, not some grand historical thing like, oh, you used to have slavery or you used to have Jim Crow. No, you're doing this today as you're in my country telling me that I shouldn't be doing this. And the only reason that his argument fell flat, and this is a, a kind of a connector in terms of domestic and foreign policy, the reason his argument fell flat was because he was actually speaking to several uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm -hmm. And what that means in practice is that he's saying this and trying to kind of take a moral grandstand to uh, essentially 
two dozen septuagenarian African Americans, right, who have lived through all of this. And the point that they made back to him was exactly, right? Like, we're not telling you this from a place of moral grandstanding. We're telling you this as people who were the victims of state violence, the victims of state oppression uh, in a nation where we were able in some ways to make huge strides uh, to come out of that. Now, the dichotomy or the kind of irony of America is that yes, they were sitting there as two dozen African-American members of Congress, and yet still an American city was on fire over issues of racial justice and oppression uh, and state violence. And so, you know, that's kind of how I see, see that. And just to kind of circle back to your last point, you know, you made this uh, point about IR scholars and how they're looking at these things, right? And in some ways, you can say, you know, you say the U.S. civil rights movement, right? But it, it actually wasn't the U.S. civil rights movement, right? It was the movement of Black Americans against the United States government. The government was not for them, right? And so it's very difficult for me to conceive that the nation would take credit for uh, a movement developing, a movement which they did everything they could to suppress, a movement for whom they maimed people, ostracized people, exiled people, murdered people, imprisoned people, right? And so I don't think that we get, uh, as a nation, kind of to take the credit for solving the problem that we are the ones who put in place. And even though we've made strides, um, it would be a lie to say that we uh, are out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. And one thing I like to say on that, Katie, and just in turning it back over to you, is about the time, you know, and we frame ourselves as kind of the longest standing, you know, global exemplar of democracy. But one thing I think I, I shared with you previously is that I, being born in 1975, am the first person in the history of my entire family to be born with the full rights of citizenship. And I know through my own historical research that my family has been in America since at least 1827. And so in 200 years, not a single person, not one, was born a full, complete, and free citizen of the United States of America until I was. And so it's very difficult for anyone, a scholar of any note, to tell me with that lived experience something different uh, than what we know and believe about the dark side of the American democratic experiment. Absolutely. This was, that was incredibly thoughtful. I, I think you're your point about sort of the difference between quote unquote, the US civil rights movement versus black American civil rights movement was super powerful and something I'll be thinking about a lot when I, when I read more about this. I, th I think that's a really, just, just a really thoughtful point. Um, and so I just wanna uh, thank you for bringing that to my attention and to the attention of the audience. Um, the other thing that I, I heard you say in there that I, I think is a fair characterization and just to give some context, I think there's some, again, IR scholars um, who would say, sure, the U.S. is a hypocrite, right? And that's, you know what? That's how they go and exercise their power and influence in the world. They're the hegemon. So they profess a set of values that they want others to adopt because it will help them. And basically, that's fine. Um, now, I think there's lots of normative arguments that one could make against that. But even putting those aside, I think what I heard from you is that, hey, as it turns out, this hypocrisy is actually dramatically affecting our ability to just get stuff done, right? It's, yeah. It makes it difficult for the U.S. to exercise that power and influence. So even if you're a proponent of sort of U.S. hegemony and U.S. unipolarity, what you're seeing is that this, this history of racism and the sort of lack of an anti-racist foreign policy is actually stymieing those attempts in, in many ways. And I think that's, that's just really important to underscore that this isn't just, quote unquote, just about human rights and sort of morality. This is also about sort of traditional power and diplomacy and these things are inherently intertwined. We can't really separate them, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, 
And then the other thing that I wanted to sort of turn to, and this is where you started to go towards, towards the end of some of your comments is sort of, I guess, what do you see as the biggest challenges to crafting an anti-racist US foreign policy today? And then what do you see as potentially one to three possible solutions? Like where do we go from here? And before I turn it over to you, I wanna say one more quick thing, which is just that in thinking about this and getting prepared to talk to you, I, I went back to sort of my own understanding of different foreign policy platforms. And it occurred to me that I have heard a ton in the last 20 years about feminist foreign policies and even countries adopting explicitly feminist foreign policy platforms but possibly because I wasn't paying enough attention or possibly because it isn't there, I haven't seen an anti-racist foreign policy platform. And I'm wondering sort of, well, to what degree that's sort of on purpose or unsurprising. Um, and again, how that feeds into how we should think about what it would look like. Um, so that was a lot of things, but I wanna pitch it back to you to talk about sort of what, it, what, what an anti-racist foreign policy would be and what are the challenges to getting there? Sure, you know, I think the first thing is acknowledgement, right? And that's where we get back to this notion of shame, right? That we have to accept that this is who we are and it's who we've created ourselves as, right? So even as we talk about IR scholars and um, this idea of just saying, oh yeah, sure, you know, we have all that. No, 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 it's not just sure. These are huge issues, right? And I think to your point, which is where I always kind of take off, yes, morality, yes, ethics, yes, human dignity and decency. But the real issue is you won't be an effective diplomat if you are racist, if you are white supremacist, if you are patriarchal and misogynist. Because in the world, you're going to have to deal with people of different ethnic backgrounds and races and histories and religions and understandings and perspectives on the world. And so holding these beliefs and not effectively diversifying our national security apparatus, our foreign policy, our diplomatic core means that we don't have the infusion of different perspectives. There's not enough women. There's not enough women of color. There's not enough black folks, right, who understand the world in a certain way from inside of America, but also because America has inside of it people from all over the world right, that are American citizens. No anthropologist can know their home country better than they can. No linguist can learn their language with the insight that they would have as Americans who are from, you know, remote regions of countries that we find valuable or that we find as inimical to our interests and the like. And so the more inclusive we can become, the stronger we will be. But our exclusionary um, policies and practices actually weaken us. And so this is why you see the proliferation of articles talking about the fact that white supremacy is a national security challenge. And the main reason it's a national security challenge is because it's a domestic security challenge. But our domestic policy, again, is the root of our foreign policy, right? That it is us extending who we are at home out into the world. And so one of the simple things, right, I, I think we ask these kinds of questions about, around what we can do. And I think often in academic and scholarly circles, we want to have, you know, charts and graphs and complicated theses of how we do this, right? But the real answer is we should be who we say we are, right? If we are a nation, that believes in the dignity of all human beings, that we believe in human rights, that we believe in democratic governance, right? Then we need to be that. But I think this kind of double-sidedness is what has gotten us in trouble in the world. And so on one hand, I recognize in foreign policy that you don't treat every nation the same, right? And it would be, unrealistic to expect. We don't treat every person that we know the same, right? I throw a ball to my dog and, you know, to catch it in his mouth, but I wouldn't do that with my mom, right? Because she's my mom. Why would I do that, right? And so I think that, you know, we don't want to get too far afield with that logic that everyone should be engaged with in the same way. 
But if we don't understand the colonial history and other uh, nations in the world and their history with the West, which is generally an exploitative, violent, repressive, and othering kind of relationship, then there's no way that we will be able to effectively engage with them um, in the present moment. Now, in terms of timing, right, I think that there is a really powerful moment um, for the push around feminist foreign policy, right? And in some ways, it's quite interesting, right? If you kind of compare, you know, kind of um, the women's movement, um, to kind of Black Lives Matter and other movements, right? And one key difference is that women are actually a majority population, right? They're not a minority, even though they're treated as one, right? In terms of, you know, uh, gender-based caste, um, if, you, if, if you will. And so what are the lessons that we can kind of take uh, from some of that? And I think in this moment, when you look a few years ago, right, with the Me Too movement, and what it brought out, right, which was to me well beyond uh, sexual harassment, but also about women's ability to be comfortable in the spaces that they reside in, to have opportunities, to not be constrained by the ignorance and the avarice of men who are in power, right? And in, and in many ways, Black people have been asking for the exact same thing, not a special place, not a select status, above and beyond other people, but simply the consideration that we deserve um, as human beings um, in this society uh, and in the world. And if you look at our moment now, I think one of the things that's special about it domestically, which could spill over into uh, foreign policy, is the kind of diverse, generational, gender, you know, sexual orientation continuum, race, when you look in the streets of America over this summer, um, throughout 110 cities, I mean, you see people of all stripes out there saying Black Lives Matter, out there saying that police brutality is wrong, making a stand against uh, unauthorized or unjustified state violence. And this is, I think, where we need to move because one of the challenges is, you know, when people say things like women's issues, well, what is that? People say, oh, no, that's a black issue. Is it really a black issue that you don't want to be murdered by an agent of the state when you haven't created, committed a crime? I don't think so, right? And so the more we can get people to galvanize around principles of safety, security, access, uh, and the right to life for all human beings, the closer I think we move to that happening in the foreign policy arena. And with the article that we wrote that you guys referred to earlier, as well as uh, a plethora of articles and convenings just like this one that are happening, I think it's so important because what's happening now, students are becoming engaged in these conversations. People who are going into the foreign service, people who are going into the military, being engaged um, in this way, who have grown up in a generation um, outside of the kind of tenseness of the 1960s coming into the 1970s uh, when, I was, um, when I was born. And so hopefully we will be able uh, to create pressure, uh, to create pressure on our governments, on our local representatives uh, to be more inclusive and to have these issues at the forefront uh, of their platforms. And we should all be saying no. Right, like it shouldn't be controversial to say that it's wrong to discriminate against women. It shouldn't be controversial to say anywhere in the world that you shouldn't discriminate against somebody based on the color of their skin, right? And it shouldn't be controversial for those of us in foreign policy and academia and the like to say this is a legacy that we have in America and we cannot be ahistorical about it because everyone else already knows it's the truth. And so in lying to ourselves and lying to them, we lose that much more respect, that much more power, and that much more capacity to be effective uh, in our relations with other nations in the world. Oh, that was fantastic. I, I could listen to you talk forever. Um, I, I wanna say just 
two quick things and then give it back to you for just one last word so that uh, we, we can wrap this up, um, sadly, for me at least. <laughs> uh, so the first is that I just I want to emphasize again what, you, what you've been saying because I think it's just incredibly important as people listen to this and sort of think about it, which is this idea that the domestic policy and foreign policy and values and interests and power are inseparable. Right, these things all go together, they're inherently intertwined, and they're, so we can't really think about them in these separate pieces, even though we as scholars often tend to do that, right? In a much sort of more menial sense, this is what my work does, right? I, I talk about how people sort of, our security-based preferences depend on our set of moral, moral beliefs, right? What we think is right and wrong spills over into what we think is right and wrong in foreign policy, right? Um, even though we tend to think of that sometimes in the scholarly world as this sort of rationalist, um, extra, uh, separate area. Um, so I thought that was really important. I also heard you talk a lot about sort of the importance of diversifying the pr profession, so diversifying the national security field, the diplomatic corps in the United States, and you talk not only about sort of um, racial diversity for Black Americans, but also about sort of the uh, the U.S. is an immigrant community full of people from different countries who can then go into the diplomatic corps and help inform U.S. foreign policy uh, on those specific areas, which was a really thoughtful point. Um, there are a million thoughtful points. <laughs> but the last thing I then think sort of on that note and thinking about the diplomatic corps and thinking about the future diplomatic corps, um, I'm wondering if you could end by talking a little bit about uh, what you would say to I don't know, a 19-year-old Dartmouth student who hopes to make a career out of this, who hopes to go into the foreign policy establishment, follow the footsteps of wonderful diplomats like yourself. Um, what should they be doing now? Learning history, but, but what else? What else could they be doing to help um, advance an anti-racist U.S. foreign policy into the future? Yeah. I think there are three main things that I would think of to start. One is to be um, focused on a specific area of expertise, whether it's human rights, whether it's gender-based violence, whether it's water and sanitation, and to try to develop a core of expertise around that particular thing that you're passionate about. Uh, the second would be then to try to pick out a regional focus, right? Whether it be Latin America or Africa or Europe um, or Asia. Um, the third would be to have a firm grasp of the history of the United States of America in relation to all of these issues, right? Because a big part of the argument that I'm making where so many uh, other countries and leaders in the world are pushing back on is that basically when we are um, denigrating leaders for being repressive, denigrating leaders for human rights abuses, denigrating leaders in the world for their treatment of women, they know that we have a history of doing those exact same things, but that we codified them into laws and global charters after the creation of the Bretton Woods Institution. And then that's where we decided the clock should start. And so now anybody who does this is a regime rather than a government, is an autocrat rather than, rather than a president, is a human rights abuser rather than a crafty politician simply trying to deal with a set of difficult circumstances, right? And I think the other thing is to have a context of the sense of pragmatism and time in foreign relations, right? And so if you look at uh, 2020 is the 60 year anniversary of what was called the year of Africa. So that was 1960 was called the year of Africa. And the reason why was because 17 or I believe 17 or 18 African nations uh, became independent in that one year. And it kind of lit the fuse uh, that led to the independence of the entire continent. But what that means is that the majority of African nations are only 60 years into their uh, independence, right? But the United States, 244 years into our independence and still struggling with some of the same challenges, right? But if you look at the United States, 60 years after 1776, 1836. Do we really want to have a conversation about human rights in America in 1836? The treatment of women in America, 1836. The treatment of indigenous people, poor people, uh, people with disabilities in America, 1836. 
No, it would be a terrible picture, just like many other nations have challenging pictures uh, right now. But through spits and starts, they got there. And so to condemn nations and to call them failing states and to be so adamant that uh, you know they are so far um, outside of this continuum of development that we have just made up, right? The places that we think that those nations should be, they didn't get there how we got to this point in our development, right? If it was just about washing hands and sleeping under mosquito nets, it would all be over with, right? But we have to acknowledge that there was genocide. We have to acknowledge that there was 300 years of chattel slavery, right? We have to acknowledge what happened to Japanese people who were interned here. We have to acknowledge all of these things if we are supposed to be world leaders who purport to be able to tell other people how um, to get to where we are. But I think, and I want to say in closing, because I meant to say this in the beginning, uh, this point about uh, the white man's burden, which is a poem that I often use by Rudyard Kipling in many of my classes, and he's often referred to as basically the poet of, of the co colonialist, right? Uh, but the idea what it was that it was the responsibility of white society and white civilizations to lead the darker people in, of the world into the light, right, of democracy, out of barbarity, into Christianity, into civilization. And so much of what we do now is rooted in that. And this is one of the reasons why we still think we are the ones who can show people the way, even as we lose our own. Uh, and one of the things I shared with you about even in our kind of, um, our fields of endeavor, whether you're at the United Nations or if you're at USAID or the State Department, you hear people say things like, you know, I'm going on mission, right? And they mean they're going to a foreign country to do work. But where does that come from, right? This is missionary, religious, proselytizing language. Or in state or aid, you hear people say, well, I'm going on a tour of duty. Well, who else says things like going on tours of duty? People who are in the military, right? So even in our efforts, to be assisting, assisting folks in lifting themselves out of these conditions that this history has created, there's still the language and the framing of proselytizing, of war, of showing people uh, the light who are in the proverbial darkness. Oh, I, I don't know how to end on a hopeful note after that. Um, I think that was incredibly important and powerful um, again, it reminds me of all these sort of studies on foreign aid and the degree to which it is actually helping versus sort of harming folks in developing countries um, or, or the global south to, in the sort of current construction of the international system. Um, it's incredibly important. I think you've given everyone who watches this a ton to think about, and hopefully that will improve the U.S. foreign policy establishment going forward as we have all these brilliant young people who are listening, who are thinking, who are learning, and who are going to help work towards crafting this anti-racist U.S. foreign policy. Um, so thank you very much uh, for teaching me a ton and for giving me the opportunity to chat with you. Thank you for coming to Dartmouth, and I look forward to talking with you more in the future. Thank you, and thank you all so much for having me. Appreciate it.